very much depends what your view of arbitration is. Um, there are two competing views of international arbitration. One very prevalent in France with Emmanuel Bayard and his uh, uh, philosophy and the arbitrage international, and the other is the British theory. The French theory would suggest that international arbitration is a truly disembodied transnational dispute resolution system, which exists distinct and apart from any national supervisory jurisdiction. And that therefore, the change of the seat of the arbitration has really no legal significance, because international arbitration is already a disembodied transnational dispute resolution system that exists truly only because of the consent of the parties, and that the New York Convention permits this because it makes set aside, because it makes non-enforcement and non-recognition of an award um, optional on the part of other convention states when the award has been set aside at the seat of the arbitration under uh, the New York Convention Article 5.1e. The other view is the British view, which considers arbitration as really nothing else but a delegation of powers by the parties um, and the courts of the seat of the arbitration to private decision makers. In that instance, arbitration is always linked to a choice of court. The choice of court is first, and it is only because the courts of that country permit an arbitral tribunal to act in its stead that the arbitral tribunal has any power at all. Under that theory, if the courts at the seat of the arbitration deem the arbitration provision to be void, arbitration ends, because the courts no longer delegate authority to act to the arbitral tribunal, and therefore there is nothing to arbitrate left. There is no legal basis for arbitration. Which of these two theories you prefer is a matter of personal choice in many ways. Um, unsurprisingly, certain jurisdictions have taken uh, sides in this. France is very much in Gaillard's camp. Um, England is very much not. Uh, the developing world, similarly, is very much not in the gay art world. In a way, the ICC being a Parisian institution, it has taken the view that arbitration is a transnational disembodied dispute resolution mechanism, meaning that the ICC will, generally speaking, encourage its tribunals to forge ahead and, you know, let the winning party take its chances at the enforcement stage. In many instances, that may well be appropriate, given that the action of the state that interferes with arbitration is really in bad faith, and it would really be a, um, it should be a stop from relying on the court action fund. That said, you're in a real theoretical pickle, uh, because what is, the, what is the legal basis for arbitration to proceed? The parties to an arbitration agreement don't really have a direct right in quite the same way under the New York Convention. The New York Convention binds states and their judiciaries to do certain things, but doesn't really give parties a right that the states do these things, and a recourse against the state if it doesn't. So that really is your problem in that case. There is a, there is a disconnect, theoretically, between what should be done um, and what the law so far provides. So if you ask me for a personal opinion, I would say that as a matter of values, I cheer every time an ICC tribunal goes on. But as a matter of law, I know it to act without authority. Ще ми излия, бъдам председател със си това. Аля, аля. Бува пара хипо с ванца. Колко време трябва да се върваме да се върваме да се върваме да се върваме да се върваме? Пайде минути. Пайде минути. Пайде минути. You have enough time. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll make it fast. How's that? We've all been in this room for a long time. It's up to you. Um, well, I thought we had that the room was booked too afterwards. 
Yes, but we are now arranging the ah, postponement of the conference. <laughs> ah, very good. Well, I'll make it fast though, so that the negotiations can stall long enough um, so, that, so that, you know, then we're done. You made it before the negotiations. Exactly. That's, that's, that's arbitration, after all, is about speedy resolution of things. <clears throat> well, so it, we talked about applicable law in the litigation context. And what I would like to discuss with you is a somewhat heretical view about applicable law in international arbitration. And what I would like to suggest to you is that if you think that an arbitral tribunal applies the law chosen by the parties, as one would expect from a local law perspective as a municipal lawyer in the chosen forum law, that would not ever happen. Arbitral tribunals cannot and do not apply the law as it would be applied in the jurisdiction, the laws of which is chosen. Now, why is that? What's our applicable law problem? Typically, international arbitral tribunals consist of three members. Typically, only one of these three members is barred in the jurisdiction of the applicable law if one even is, which means that you're asking two lawyers who are not barred in the relevant jurisdiction to apply that law. Do you, you think that if you typically require people to go to law school in a country and sit a bar, that there's really something special about a country's law in order to be able to practice it. So just as a matter of uh, logic, it would seem very improbable that an arbitral tribunal consisting of foreign lawyers could faithfully apply foreign law. Um, this is augmented further by the fact that counsel in these proceedings typically also are not barred in the relevant jurisdiction. Just as a matter of personal experience, I made a list of the applicable laws that I have pled in my time, and uh, I can tell you that in many of these cases, I'm not barred. I mean, I'm barred in the United States, and I've played United States law. But English law, German law, French law, Polish law, Russian law, Kazakh law, Mongolian law, Philippine law, Algerian law, Venezuelan law, per Peruvian law, Brazilian law, and public international law. Well, it, I similarly, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I'm in no way special. I mean, th this is sort of a typical list for arbitration practitioners, would have a bias by my own legal training as to how I view relevant legal considerations. So the fact that you have lawyers who are not barred in the relevant jurisdiction plead these cases to non-lawyers from the relevant jurisdiction typically means that the result that you get has to be something other than what you get in a local court in which you'd have to be represented by people who are barred in the local jurisdiction, or at least be assisted by people who are barred in the local jurisdiction. But let me ask you, if I were to show up in Georgian court and start, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm representing so-and-so, hi. Uh, I, would I be allowed to do that? Probably not, right? If I showed up in Kansas, where I'm currently teaching, I'm not barred in Kansas, the Kansas court would tell me, well, you'd have to get admitted. So that's kind of the problem, that you, know, you, you have a real disconnect in terms of the input into the system, so that you could not really expect that the output of the system would be that which you'd expect it to be. Namely, well, we apply English law, we apply Georgian law. Now, a counsel for both sides, as well as the arbitral tribunal, applies comparative law techniques in order to overcome this problem. Doesn't mean that we don't apply any law in arbitration, it doesn't mean that arbitration is up for grabs. It doesn't mean that it is completely unpredictable. It just means that we operate by means of a different process. Um, and the comparative law process that we use is to compare the law that is to be applied to the law that we know and the law that we know the tribunal members know. What we rely upon are the prejudgments that are sort of ingrained in our legal training and that we have read about you know, the other legal systems. 
to make decisions about how we're going to approach applicable law. Think back to your first year of law school. My assumption is that there are many things that have kind of been burned into your consciousness, right? Certain things, that, there are certain professors that I still remember, sometimes fondly, sometimes with dread, but well, this is something you have to do this way, don't do it the other way. And those are the kind of prejudgments that kind of walk with you as you plead any case that you do. And um, so what I would like to do with you, rather than drone on about Gadamerian hermeneutics and how there is a theoretical basis and rhetoric to do this, is to just do a bit of a practical experiment. Do you have culpa in contrahendo as a matter of Georgian law? Yes. As a Texas lawyer, I would tell you, we don't have such a thing. Now, assume that I am the chair of a tribunal, barred in Texas, and you have to explain culpa in contrahendo to me, because German law or Georgian law, I would assume both are relatively close on this point, is the applicable law. How would you try to explain to somebody that culpa in contrahendo is actually a legal doctrine and what it means? Maybe to provide some legal research or legal opinion about this issue. You know, I'm a Texas lawyer, I don't read no Latin, and I tell you all these god dang experts, they're just writing in Latin the entire time. I cannot understand a word they're saying, so I guess I just, I just gotta put on my hat and figure this out on my own now. Could you give me any guidance? Maybe I'm putting it on a little thick, but it, you get the idea. I mean, legal experts are great. The problem is that legal experts typically write in their own idiot, which means that unless you know the law that they're briefing you on, um, they're not going to be very helpful. I mean, they can be tremendously helpful if they're good comparative lawyers, but what is it that they would have to do to educate a Texas lawyer about culpa and contrahendo in Georgian law? Ah, you're coming in Latin again. I have no idea what it is that you're saying. <laughs> then it was wrong to choose you as an arbitrator, so. <laughs> well, no, I, I have great industry experience in this field, and I think that I will understand what the, what the parties in this case really wanted. I mean, none of the parties in this case are from Georgia. They're, uh, they're uh, you know, from... Uh, I don't know, Azerbaijan and uh, Poland, and the uh, case concerns and uh, uh, oil supply contract, and I know oil supply contracts, I tell you that much. have experts. What? The, the problem with experts is, what, what is the expert going to tell? Opinions? Well, I like opinions. <laughs> Everyone has one. And what is it that you'd have to do in that context. How do you educate somebody who's a foreign lawyer about a concept that they think is just out of this world bizarre? Something that they would have read in their first year contracts class just doesn't exist. Pre-contractual liability is something that is incredibly hard to prove and it's not possible on a contract theory. I think the party shall ensure that there is another arbitrator from civil jurisdiction who will explain this issue to another jurisdiction from common law. Well, and, and, and that sometimes helps. But the, the problem, again, is that you'll have people say something to the effect of, well, he's very charming, but I don't understand the word he's saying. He speaks all that civilian stuff. If you could just speak English. You know, I mean, that's kind of, it, 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 I'm exaggerating again, but you, you'd need to, what is it that that person could do if they did it well? that you could also do. Because that is the art of advocacy in international arbitration. And it's also the way that you understand what the applicable law in arbitration actually ends up being. 
is there any other theory that you, come, that you could come at me with other than a contractual theory about what culpa in contrahendo is? Is there any other analog that you could draw that might draw the sting from my um, you know, notion that we don't have such a thing in the law of contracts? You could, you could explain it in tort. How would you explain it in tort? According to the text law. <laughs> well, I, the, 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 the way you try to do it probably is to say that, well, you know, there, there, there is, it, it, as a matter of U.S. law, the one tort that is kind of every tort in many ways is negligence, which is premised upon the existence of a duty, its breach, causation, and damages. Well, that seems to be a theory that you could make work, in a way, with culpa and contrahendo. Incidentally, there are people in Kutu um, Germany that would tell you that culpa and contrahendo really could not very much be a, a contractual theory in any event. Yeah? It, it, it really sits much more in the context of, uh, of, of delictual liability, potentially, and that we only got here because Really, we had a Praetorian edict at some point in pre-classical in, in, pre, in the pre-classical period, in which we had an actio doli that was a quasi-delictual actio, and therefore uh, we should really plead it much more in terms of delictual liability. So, I mean, just all this to say that you could make this work if you had to. So, how, how would how, what is the duty that I would have? Um, in the context of culpa and contrahendo. What is the duty you would say the party that has acted with fault in contracting breached? And what, what does good faith mean in this case? Because good faith, that, that's another one of them terms that I just look at and go, I have no idea what you mean. I mean, a, a Texas lawyer, when you say good faith, if they're an older generation, would generally think honesty and fact. And a person could be perfectly honest in fact and still act in violation of their good faith duty as a matter of culpa and contrahendo. What, what is it that you'd have to be? Let me ask it differently. Typically, what is the problem in culpa and contrahendo? What are your elements to prove that it occurred? What, what, what is what is the what's the factual predicate of my fault? What typically must be the case for there being fault on my part in any? Negligent action. Gross negligence. And, and how am I grossly negligent? Because that's where because negligence is, is your overlap between both systems. Um, how how what is the act that I have done that I shouldn't have done? So, so typically, you're, you're very much going in the right direction. I mean, you're upsetting expectations of your counterparty based upon prior representations. So fundamentally, there is a notion that I've made a representation that you could reasonably rely upon as a matter of a letter of intent, for vertrag, or something in that direction, that I'm now fundamentally deviating from. I'm changing the terms of the deal. So the, the theory that you, I mean, is overly simplistic, but I mean, the theory you come up with is that the duty is consistency. Consistency between term one in my term sheet and action, inconsistency with action 10 in my later negotiations. So there you'd have the breach of the duty. Now you'd say that is what caused me to walk away from the negotiations, and that did me harm because I now couldn't close the transaction, the other buyer went away or whatever. That would be a means to explain to somebody who's very much used to the law of negligence, but would have no idea about what culpa and contrahendo is, how this concept works. Now, 
it's not really how it works, right? It's analogous to how it works. It's fitting a, 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 a square peg in a round hole, but it comes close enough. You're using the prejudgments of somebody who sits on a tribunal who would have certain preconceptions burnt into their mind in first year torts. Have any of you had the privilege of, of uh, uh, sitting in on a class when Rory Bahadur was here? Rory Bahadur is one of our torts professors at Washburn and he comes over quite regularly and he makes sure that none of our students ever forget how negligence works. On their deathbed, they'll be able to recite how negligence works. So that's kind of the prejudgment that you have to mobilize in your favor in arguing these cases. Now, that's how you'd make it work on the one hand, right? You'd create a legal framework that makes actionable the right kind of facts and leads to the correct kind of result. In terms of comparative law, Schlesinger um, was somebody at, at uh, Hastings and Cornell who used such a method. He looked at very specific, how do these problems get solved in specific jurisdictions and then work backwards from that to establish a um, similarity of rules, similarity of legal principles between different um, legal systems, even when it appeared that there was none. Um, so you would do something like that in order to convince the arbitral tribunal. Now on the other hand, it's very easy to defeat this argument. Because what you'd do is you'd fish out any number of Texas cases who'd tell you that good faith and negligence are not the same thing. You'd then say that, well, here I have this piece of paper that says that Georgian law, culpa in contrahendo, is a matter of the good faith doctrine. Therefore, the proof that opposing counsel is making goes too fast. So you'd have a back and forth between both parties in their explication of the applicable law in terms other than those that you would use in the context of Georgian law. I mean, this must seem like a very strange way to you guys of how to conceive of culpa and contrahendo, right? This must be like Martian law rather than Georgian law. But that's what you do in arbitration. Now, you end up with something then that is not the applicable law as it would stand in the jurisdiction from which it originates. You end up with something that is an approximation of that law in terms of uh, the philosophy of language and philosophy of interpretation that would be a fusion of the horizons. You fuse the horizon on the one hand of the jurisdiction whose law you chose meant the horizon of your decision maker. And when we talk about transnational law, there are many um, jurists to say that in arbitration we apply a form of transnational law that harmonizes the various legal systems of the world into a lex mercatoria, lex sportiva, it, oh, it, it, choose your lex and somebody has said it. Um, that's not really what happens. What I'm submitting to you is as, as you make the sausage, what happens is that there is a process that arbitration counsel uses that's consistent. And the process is the process of comparative law. It is the legal comparison of various different systems, which you will do with the help of experts. I mean, I would have no idea before I would speak to an expert as to how certain things would work in Kazakh law. I have a general idea, but I would have really, you know, no way of knowing what is the correct analogy to make. So I'd have to quiz my Kazakh expert and ask them, Okay, now really walk me through it. What about this fact? What about that fact? Does that change it? Does that change it? So that I can come up with the correct analogy to make that is as close as possible to what I need. But I mean, it's that process of decision making that makes international arbitration into such a truly transnational legal practice. And it's that skill in advocacy that makes applicable law. If you know that skill, there is not a law in the world that you couldn't apply in an arbitration, despite the fact that you wouldn't have studied it for one day. Despite the fact that you know nothing about it before picking up, like, you know, a book about this thin, a phone book of, of law professors, and educate yourself. And, you know, you could then educate the Texas chair. 
So this is a very different, very heretical perspective in many ways on how applicable law works. It has nothing to do with the law as it stands on the books. It has everything to do with law as it is pled in practice. But just as a counterweight in many ways, I thought that it would be helpful to just introduce that kind of process of decision making of how arbitration counsel actually go about making the law plausible to arbitral tribunals. To those of you who were at my Jura Novit Curia talk, I think you may now understand why I have such doubts about the possibility of Jura Novit Curia, simply because law is the process of engagement between counsel. It isn't some abstract set of rules that your arbitrators would have great difficulty knowing on their own anyways. Um, so with that, I've gone a little over the time that I'd hoped to go, given how late it is. Let me throw it open for questions, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed the day. Uh, <laughs> What I tried to do is, much less artfully, what, um, there's a great book on good faith in European contract law which I'm sure my co-panelists know far better than I do by uh, Zimmerman and Whitaker. And it observes that there is no such thing as good faith in English law as a general doctrine in the same way as it exists in continental European law. But that nevertheless you can find analogs for much of the situations in which good faith becomes actionable in continental European law so that you can always find an English way translation, though imperfect, for how good faith works. And that is really the art of advocacy. I would, I would think that they exaggerate in their quest for finding harmony between English law and continental European law. I'm, I'm by no means a nihilist when it comes to saying that there are certain core principles but you have to be incredibly careful because you have a perspectival bias. The moment that you start off with a project about good faith in European contract law, you're incredibly likely to find it. So, you know, that's, that's where I think, you know, that's the exercise that you do as counsel. And as counsel, you, you have more, much more cynical um, designs than, a, than an academic. You want to win your case. Um, but I mean, it, on an academic side, if you want to see how this translation works much more artfully than I've done it right now, that is, a, that is really a great book that walks you through multiple case studies where it does a comparison of the various European laws, including English law, that it notes in the introduction doesn't really have good faith. Um, so yeah, the duty of care is something that you could use for that purpose. There are many other things you could use for that purpose. But find what it is in the factual matrix that makes good faith an actionable rule. What are the factual circumstances that if fact A, fact B, and fact C then result D? And then look for rules in other jurisdictions where you have, well, if fact A, B, and C, you know, little one, it's slightly different, but it's close, then a result D1. That's how you do the legal translate. And that's what um, international lawyers 
dealing outside of a court context have to constantly do. It's a constant task of translation.